Hello and welcome to Critical Line Item. My name's Tom Rabbit. Thank you for joining me to the, this particular podcast. Anyone that monitors this series will know I've been looking intensely, particularly because of the uh, Parliamentary Committee inquiry in Australia about issues to do with uh, extremism, radicalisation, and looking at case studies of individuals that have uh, entered into and then exited uh, what people would call extreme movements. It, it really doesn't matter what the movements are. If, they're, uh, if they involve people getting enmeshed, uh, radicalised, and then having to go out, it's useful to understand how all this happens. My guest for this podcast has a fascinating story. Um, he's Jewish, but he didn't find that out until later in life. But for a long period of time, he was an office bearer in the National Socialist Movement in the United States. His name's Fred Cook, and I'm going to I'm going to uh, introduce him now and uh, get him to tell the story because there's nothing better than hearing it from from uh, the source itself. Fred, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's sometimes difficult to get an audience for who we were and to talk about you know, what we've learned from those experiences. But I think it's important that um, the message that a lot of people who are former members of extremism um, to really get their message out. Now, in order to get out, um, you had to find a way in. How did you end up getting involved in... Uh, extremist movement, uh, an extremist movement in your younger days? Um, well, I didn't really have uh, an ethnic identity. Whenever I asked my grandmother what I was, she didn't know we're probably German. Um, so we didn't really have that, that identity. And I also wasn't very well accepted by people. So when a friend came around that had other friends that you know, they were just willing to accept me because I was white. Um, and they all wanted to be your best friend, you know. So it kind of gave me that identity and that that um, feeling of acceptance. Okay. Um, uh, so what were the neighborhoods, for example, that, that you grew up in that caused, that, that, that may have contributed to a sense of sort of um, a lack of identity, a sense of our needs. I grew up in a mostly Cambodian, Laotian, Vietnamese neighborhood. It's referred to as Little Cambodia in Philadelphia. Um, so I grew up there. I wasn't very well accepted because I was that weird white kid that lived with all the Cambodians. Um, so my family decided later on to move to an Irish neighborhood. And in the Irish neighborhood, I also didn't find much acceptance or anything because I didn't celebrate St. Patrick's Day in the same way or, you know, just small, meaningless things that, that I really wasn't accepted by them. With the skinheads, they had the saying, you know, if you're white, you're all right. And it kind of gave me that identity. Okay. That that is the seed of where you came from in terms of getting into a, a group, finding a, a sense of, I guess, identity, a sense of belonging. Right. Um, how do you get from there to becoming more radicalised? I was in high school. Um, nobody knew that, you know, most of my friends were skinheads because at the time I didn't really care, you know, anything about race or any of that. I was just having friends and partying. Um, so I'm in school and a black girl had asked if I would go out with her. I told her I was already seeing somebody. She got mad and she told a bunch of the other students that I called someone that I called her the N word. And at the end of the school day, I walk outside and I'm jumped by 12 kids hitting the back of the head with a brick and 
left in a coma. And then, um, then that, that so you, you you see that as the formative, that formative experience, which then said, okay, if they if they don't like me, and this is the consequences of them not liking me, then I belong over here. Right, right. It was very much so. Uh, what they were saying was not so much being proven because it's one isolated incident. What I've learned over the years is you can't judge everything from an isolated incident, but it was one isolated incident where people, you know, did horrible things. Um, horrible things happen to everybody all the time and you can't blame everybody or, you know, they're, they're, you're in trouble. Um. So from there, Fred, you go to the National Socialist. By what point do you go to the NSM? Because you're in you're in the in a cohort of people call them skinheads. Um, uh, so when at what point do you go to the National Socialist movement? I was living in North Carolina. Um, down in the south, and it was very much so a segregated place. Um, okay. And it was difficult to make friends out there, especially having children. And so I had looked online for information on different organizations that were active, actually doing work. And the NSM popped up. I contacted them, met with them at a a small meet and greet event in Georgia, and I joined. Okay, so at that point, you were you were uh, still very much focused on the kind of the white identity, etc. Uh, so you joined. At how long did it take you to end up work? Yeah. You know, moving from being an ordinary member to getting into the, the, the hierarchy? It was roughly six months. I got my patch as a full member and probably six months after that, I was already doing a lot of work for the NSM. Um, I was asked to be region three leader and then the, uh, the larger area leader, um, stepped down I was asked to be that and it just sort of happened to where I kept working into positions that were above me above uh, where I was mm -hmm. and uh, I started organizing rallies and events I started organizing meetings um, and things like that out in North Carolina and I moved up through the ranks and it took me about, I'd say, a year, and I was the chief of staff just under Jeff Scoot. The you now you're organising rallies and organising meetings and everything else. Um, it's an interesting process. And how did you find um, the external focus on the organisation? That is the media focus on the organization because you have an objective when you're organizing, for example, rallies. What were the things that that you were looking to achieve when you were sitting in that role, um, organizing various activities? Basically, it was the goal was to get media involvement, to get media to cover it. No matter what they say, no media is bad media. Um, no coverage is bad coverage. It's going to reach, you know, the right person here or there. Okay. So, Bob, um, how many people would you get to a, a rally roughly? What was the number of people that would have to have to be present to make it um, a, a, a rally that's noticeable? Um, anywhere between 50 to 100 people, a 50 to 100 people rally would gather probably five to 600 counter protesters and 
the media would be there. So you wouldn't want all it would take is about 50, 50, 50 to 100. To 100. And then you, know, you, you would expect 10 times or roughly 10 times the number if we say it's 50. As, yeah. counter, as counter protests, did that happen all? Did, did that happen all the time while you were in the uh, position of organising this these things? Oh yeah, yeah. But that's the one thing. Every organisation that's in the white separatist organisation framework, all of them have the same basic uh, structure. They want to get out there. They know that's going to be 10 to one easily when it comes to people that are counter protesting. So you have to try and get as many of your guys there to get as, as many counter protesters as possible there, because you know, what you're going to say is inflammatory. You know, you know, what you're, you're going to say is going to get a row out of people and it would make them act up and the news would have to cover it. The news would have to, to be there. And it, it, it if you're an impressionable kid like I was, if I saw something like these guys standing against this insurmountable force dressed in these uniforms, you know, shouting that they're doing it for some noble cause, that would at least get my attention. And that's why I'm, I'm a big exponent of not giving these things a lot of media attention. Uh, can we touch on that briefly? Because... We've had the debate in this country, mm -hmm. in Australia, uh, about um, the appropriateness of covering and how uh, uh, organisations and individuals, uh, given your experience, uh, how do you believe um, people should uh, cover events for example, an extremist rally or, or something else, uh, given what you've just said, which is uh, providing names and, and, I, and a, a specific identity um, feeds into a group's narrative and basically feeds the beast, right? What's the appropriate way of covering these organisations in your view? as dry as humanly possible. Don't allow any flourishes in the words you use. You know, it, 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 you read the news whenever it comes out and it's local about an event that happened. It's always this many people were injured. They don't tell you it was people hurting each other out in the counter protest areas or anything, you know, but, you know, overall a peaceful rally. And they know, they know that when they say overall a peaceful rally, there is no peaceful rally with hate speech. Um, so when you're out there, it is a peaceful rally, but you know they're going to report it as, you know, peaceful and get people riled up. You have to be very meticulous in, in being cold and dry when reporting on it. Nothing like the infamous neo-Nazi organization, nope, just the National Socialist Movement. Very cut and dry, very, very without pomp or fluff or any excess beyond what's needed to be known. Um, uh, would you argue that an organization's name should not be mentioned? Yeah. Okay. yeah I, I don't think organizations should ever be mentioned because you're always going to have somebody that's going to see it and you know, want to look it up, want to look up the information. Um, and some people are going to get involved with it because of it. Some people are going to take that next step. It, 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 can, be, it can be challenging because of the, the way in which different media organisations work and, and, and that. So I understand and appreciate what you're saying. Um, but from the role of chief of staff with organising events and all that sort of thing, um, you end up leaving. What prompted your exit? 
Um, before the actual date that I left, I started having questions. We started getting a lot of emails and messages and phone calls from people saying, I was looking on Facebook and that member that's a member of our organization has a black friend. I think they're, you know, Antifa, or I think they're spying on us or they're COINTEL Pro or something like that. And it was always, I, I would say 10, 10 a day, every day. <laughs> and it started to le lead me to recognize that the whole brotherhood, the whole we're all together, you know, we've got each other's back. That was false. And that was one of the initial things that drew me to affiliating at all was the brotherhood aspect, the fraternity aspect. So once that came down, I, I had other questions. And I know if I asked those questions amongst any members, or even if I talked to Jeff at that time, it would have been, you know, well, I could possibly be the enemy. Um, these questions would question everything. Like, you know, the Jews in Nazi Germany, one third of the population were killed overall um, through Hitler's reign. Mm -hmm. When you know these things, even if you believe in some form of Holocaust denial, where I saw uh, one person on a website when I was still a member say something along the lines of, it was closer to 500,000 Jews that were killed. What does it matter? There was a lot of people that were killed and a whole population of, of individuals. You, yeah, you start to you start to ask that question um, at that point. How long does it take from you seeing certain developments, seeing essentially people who are members of the NSM inform on other members of the NSM? All right. All right. Which is what you're, which is effectively what you're, what you're describing. Uh, yeah. Um, so the subculture, the extremist group, then has people who are who are creating the out group. Here's someone who hangs out with us, who's hanging out with. How long from that realization is the eventual move from detachment well, about from? About six months in total, it took the birth of my daughter was the, the last day I was officially a member. Um, I was doing work with the group Anonymous, and we were doing uh, dark web work, trying to find people with child pedophile pages and get their information leaked, get their websites taken down, um, that type of thing. And on the day that my daughter was born, I get a phone call from another high ranking member. And he said, I heard you're working with the hacker group anonymous. You're working with the enemy. So what does this mean? Are you an enemy now? And that was basically it. I basically effectively resigned eight years ago on the day of my daughter's birthday. Now, uh and there's probably also something else going on when you've got a a, a child coming, isn't there? You, you're thinking yeah. about you. You start. You start also thinking about what sort of world. You know, you eventually, of course, your daughter. But what sort of world the child's going to live in? Right. Right. You, you, you see things from the perspective of not just me and now, but them and their future. It, it's very sobering and it puts a lot of the things that you had doubts about into a different light. It makes it easier to just say, this isn't right. You, from your teens, when you enter into a movement in, in sort of adulthood, when you leave a movement, you then have uh, it then discover something about your background that turns everything you've ever done before on its head. 
Fred, how did you discover that you had a Jewish background? Um, well, forever I've been wanting to do an ancestry DNA test and, you know, just find out what my ancestry is. And when it finally came back, which was this January, um, when it finally came back, it said Ashkenazi, Jewish and Irish. So even though I wasn't accepted into the Irish community that I partially grew up in, I was Irish. I wasn't German like everybody thought, and I was Jewish. And that was, wow. What did that, what did that realization, I mean, you've described it as wow, but um, I suspect the impact had was a little bit deeper than just wow. <laughs> uh, am I right? Absolutely. It, it, it first brought a lot of tears. I was really broken because not only did I predominantly focus on, you know, anti-Semitism in my past, but it was now I focused on anti-Semitism against my own people, the people that I could have known all this time. And it was really earth shattering because all of the, the anti-Semitic work that we did from flyers that were, you know, the Jews do this and the Jews control this industry. And that's why, you know, there's an anti-white agenda there. And all of that sort of it hits you like a ton of bricks. So from, from realization of origin. Mm -hmm which is only very recent. Yeah. How do you then begin to orient yourself towards you know, embracing, you know, the, the matters of faith and, and the belief system? Um, well, I, I at first just decided I was going to study the people, the, the culture, the food, you know, what makes everything inherently Jewish. That was all I was going to do. And the more I had read, the more it would mention, well, this is how Jews are, you know, this is how they view God and the context that they view God. And I would, you know, kind of tilt my head like I never knew that. And by about the fifth book that I had read that was trying to be as secular as possible, it was still sort of giving small tidbits of Jewish wisdom and by about the fifth book I had finished reading, I was absolutely immersed into learning everything about Judaism as well. So what changes does that make you know, to your life? Because... Um, things then start to align a little bit differently, right? All right. All right. Well, my wife was, she's always been very supportive. Um, when she found out, you know, I was Jewish, she was like, you know, it doesn't really matter who you are. I know who you are, that type of thing. And so it wasn't too bad on her. She is trying now to study Judaism as much as she possibly can to get a better idea and she may or may not convert with me. Where are you at in the process of, you know, former, formally entering into the, the faith? Are you, you, um, you, you, it's clear that you've marked out the sort of the Sabbath. <laughs> Uh, yeah. as, as and all of that you 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 got into that vibe but um how do you you know how, at what point are you in terms of getting to to do a more formal um i am 6 months into the process now i have another 7 or 8 months because i still have to complete a full uh judaism course which is 4 months long um, but I have not missed a single Shabbat service online. My kids all say the Shabbat with me. Okay. Um, even my five-year-old knows, you know, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. She's got it memorized. And uh, 
we don't, we're not forcing the kids into our religion. We believe in letting them have their own choice, but so far all four of them are choosing to do the ceremonies with us and sort of live a Jewish lifestyle. Uh, which it, it, children take things in rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so it doesn't surprise me uh, that, that that's happening. You then, you, but before you discover you've got, you, you're essentially Jewish, you moved to working with Chef Scoop and the team at Beyond Barriers. Yeah. Now, to describe the work you do with Beyond Barriers and then where, it, where, where, you, where you fit in. Um, I'm the associate director of Beyond Barriers. We work in counter extremism, counter domestic terrorism. Um, we work towards breaking ideology. We work towards reassimilating people into society and, and rehabilitating them from, you know, the ideology that, that mm -hmm. they were a part of. Um, but we also work with, you know, other extremists from the far left, the religious extremism, um, the far right. It, it's very all encompassing of what we do, but a good many of us have experience in uh, the far right. So when we write a lot of the stuff that we write and try to, to tell people, it's mostly our focus. Um. In how did you find how do you find having to sit down with people and having the conversation to, to, to help them extricate themselves? Yeah, well, that's one of the great things about anybody. Anybody can change, anybody can become what they want to do to some degree. Um if you really are dedicated to trying to change beyond barriers has a lot of different methods that we utilize that, that would help. Um, we believe in having people uh, learn from other formers to, to sort of learn how that got, how they got out, what they did when they got out. Mm -hmm. um, it's really beneficial to, to see people, when you've broken them free of different things that they've held on to for years. And, and that's the, the, the gist of what we do. Where would it, I, I guess you're, you're doing this work at a unique time in American in history. Where, where do you see, um, as someone who's been there, how do you see the, the, the current environment in, in your country? Currently, the, the sad thing that a lot of uh, people don't realize is racism has been rebranded. Racism in America and hate, hate groups in America have rebranded to now they are patriot groups. Now they are groups for America, but their ideas for America are very anti-American. Um, it's very much so a complete rebranding to try to be seen as the softer, gentler hate group, but it's still hate groups at, at their, their core. It's still most of the same people involved from hate groups in their group as the core of it. Is it also... It, I mean... It's kind of inter interesting as well because it isn't just groups sitting outside of the halls of uh, you know, power, if you like. It did, it did, the connections seem to intersperse, now, don't they, with uh, people in Congress or in state legislatures? And uh, How do you see that? I see it to where... We've had a very opportune experience in our point in history to see things subjectively from the outside. We see that police officers, just recently a police chief in America 
um, was found doing some really racist things on the job. Racists can be anywhere. Racists can be anyone. When you're fighting an enemy that's almost invisible, you have to take every lead you can get. You have to, to sort of see things through a different set of eyes. And right now the news just pushes the narrative that they're all just hate groups, but at their essence, they're fear groups. All of the groups that are out there are fear groups. Um, and you can say that about all forms of extremism. They're afraid for their country. They're afraid of other people and other races, you know, destroying their race. They're afraid of their religion being made a victim. You can say that about just about every hate group that's out there. And a lot of the times the media just pushes this narrative that it's about hate and it, it emboldens people. It emboldens everybody that's in that movement, whether they say they're a hate group or not, they're just happy to see us mentioned. Um, and I guess it, it, it leads to the, the obvious question and it's one that, um, I may be able to predict the answer, but I'll get you to I'll get you to respond rather than put uh, put words in your mouth. Um, how do you fix it? The best way to fix it, I think, is to further minimalize it. Um, everybody's afraid of hate groups, and they rightfully should be. That they do turn violent often. They do have violent elements and aspects, but when it's almost glorified, when it's, you're mentioning members' organizations, you're mentioning members' names, you're making them infamous. Well, if somebody can't be famous in life, if their only other option is infamy, they might go for it. And a lot of the news is doing this. A lot of the news is giving them coverage that they want. It's like putting a little bit of gasoline on the fire every five to 10 minutes. And that's, that's, in essence, what the news has been doing for so long. Instead of running counter narratives, instead of running, you know, saying this group is here and this is why they're wrong. You know, it, more than that, if you're going to mention the group, mention it, mention it in a context in which it can be devoid of emotion, devoid of anything that would remotely be seen as promotional. We are in a, in a media climate today where the predominant incentive, if you like, um, for, for news uh, content, particularly online, is generating eyeballs to generate advertising. Right. In making the suggestion you did in relation to coverage, you, you're also effectively saying we've got to work out how to tame the media beast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, because people tend to focus on issues by exception. They don't particularly care about the fact Farmer Brown's cow had a calf right, even though that might be good for Farmer Brown and maybe the community, depending on whether Farmer Brown has a dairy, okay, then another, produ another producing unit exists. But um, if you look at where you're at, you know, how do you curb that culture that is... Um, ingrained in, in, in media today, which is you know, getting people to respond emotionally means we'll get eyeballs. Right. It'll, it'll get shared. Not only will it go on the website, but somebody might decide to flick it to Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, you know, TikTok, whatever. Um, uh, the, uh, how do you do? How do you grapple with that, it, it, from, from the perspective of someone who's looking at how you how you sort of contract 
the audience uh, base for uh, any extremist movement? Right now, it's it's all about ratings. It's all about hits. It's all about clicks. It's all about advertisement. <clears throat> I think the best way of getting beyond that is sort of making it to where there's a different advertising structure to where the news is relegated to a specific structure of, of the advertisement pool, so to speak, that it generates, um, depending on other factors other than viewership. Because right now it's a, a very fear-driven thing. It, it's, it's very much so as explosive as a Hollywood movie on your nightly news. You know, all of your neighbors want to shoot their, 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 their guns out at night and, you know, other people have a problem with it and they're outside arguing and your other neighbors have been violent criminals forever and they just killed somebody down the block and it's always something negative. How about sh some positive, you know, what, what they refer to in the news as fluff. Well, if it's a slow day, instead of perpetuating something that doesn't need to be out there, Put on a piece of fluff if it's a slow, a slow news day. Something like Polly's Chicken just won first place at the prize, you know, at the, at the, the fair. Put something out there that's somewhat positive. Put something out there that, that isn't fear-inducing. You know, I, I mean, when, when news comes out about just about anything today, my mother calls me on the phone and she's like, did you hear? We're all going to die again. There's this horrible new thing. And I'm always like, that's exactly who they're targeting with their ads. They, they want to draw you in, have you fe feel fear, feel vulnerable, and then promote their ads for their sponsors. Hmm. The, I mean, I've just, um, interestingly, while we've been talking, uh, I noticed an alert that's come in, and this is where mobile phones and media organisations with apps are very dangerous. I've noticed an alert that, that tells me you know, four men have been fined $16,000 after they fled in a super yacht and lied their way into Queensland to watch a rugby match. We're in the, the New South Wales is in the middle of a coronavirus lockdown. So, I mean, that's part of the whole uh, issue of people being um, afraid of. And in, in that story, it's people enforcing the rules, right? Right. But, you know, to, to even think that individuals would go to the effort of get, boarding a yacht and going up to Queensland for a rugby match, it, it's something else. <laughs> yeah. That, it, it, that would be good news. For somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not if you're the person that's paying $4,000 a head um, because you've broken uh, the coronavirus restrictions of your home state. <laughs> but, <laughs> look, Fred, it's... Um, and it, it, that's a convenient uh, point at which sort of conclude what we've what we've uh, been talking about. But I do know that you've got material that you've written online. I've read several of your pieces online. If people want to read a bit more of your thinking about uh, sort of extremism and and, and the coming out and, and other topics. Where can they find you? Um, BeyondBarriersUSA.org. Um, <clears throat> the official Beyond Barriers website, I write a lot. <laughs> I am always writing new content for there, <clears throat> as well as my own website, SonOfSinai.com. Um, again, that has a lot of my writings on converting to Judaism, as well as just on extremism and you know, where I went from point A to point B in my transformation. I hope people go and check it. It's been a really illuminating discussion with you. And Fred, thank you for joining me for, for this chat. 
Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. And hope we get to chat again pretty soon. Likewise.